quality of projects and clients and alignment of values first and foremost. Doesn't matter the size. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears. And of course, this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more profitable and impactful architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. And today's my pleasure to welcome Erica Moody back on the show. Erica has previously talked with us about uh, firm merger, and the conversation was so good, we ended up creating a separate episode around that. And we are here literally minutes later, but by the time you listen to this, uh, some time <laughs> will have passed. And we want to jump into more of the story behind uh, this merger, but also the leadership lessons that are uh, in store here. So just by way of introduction, Erica Moody, F-I-I-D-A, is the president of Helix Architecture and Design, which is based out of Kansas City. It's about a 35-person firm, but as we know, all firms sort of ebb and flow a little bit. They also have an office in Denver. And Erica, in a previous episode, talked about how she was approached or got into conversations with Helix architecture and design. And at the time she was running a small startup practice after having left a larger practice. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. So Erica, welcome back to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What, a, what an amazing experience having been in a larger practice where you were one, were you a principal at that practice? I was, shareholder and okay. principal. So yes. you were a shareholder and principal. So you actually had mm -hmm. um, equity in the firm as a shareholder mm -hmm. and you were the leader of a studio. What was the particular uh, vertical in that studio? Oh, I, the Kansas City Metro, uh, primarily for me, workplace and, and headquarters, workplace design. To jump out of an opportunity like that, I'm always curious by what uh, what what causes people to do that. Either it's intense pain, misalignment of values, um, or amazing opportunity that they think that they could pursue elsewhere, or something else. Would you mind sharing with us as much as you can about what le led you to leave an opportunity like that? Yeah, sure. Um, you're not you're not wrong. Those are probably all really good reasons to leave, but I can't say that any one of those was exactly what uh, our situation was. My partner and I had been on some incredible projects and and, and had been really uh, given an, uh, it, immense opportunities. Our previous practice no longer exists. They were uh, purchased by HOK soon after we left. And I mentioned that because I think we knew as young shareholders that there was something sort of going on um, and that for that firm to transition and continue, that there would need to be a merger or an acquisition. Um, we did a lot of sports work. And so for me personally, I was not in that vertical. But as you may or may not know, Kansas City has an incredible sports architecture history. And that particular firm had some of the best. Um, they worked on fantastic projects. And so for them, being able to transition that firm to HOK and continue to grow that practice was a great opportunity. We didn't know that was going to happen. But like I said, you sometimes know things are sort of in the works. Um my partner and I primarily worked in Kansas City and somewhat of a family choice to not be on a plane so often like we'd seen our colleagues traveling. You know, this was well, well, well before the days of, of Zoom and being able to carry a lot of these meetings on virtually. And so for us, it was always very much a purposeful choice to be in Kansas City and have our work there. I think we knew that that might not always be the case as some transitions happened. And so we saw that as an opportunity. Um, we also have a healthy dose of self-confidence. So there probably was that bit of us that wanted to go and do this our own way. And maybe there was a bit of 
if we see it, how would we do it? And what if we could just look, he could look left to me, right to me, you know, and we could say, let's do it. And that would be all it was, would take. We had 17 shareholders and we would just be the two of us. And so there was appeal to a smaller practice, maybe being a little more nimble, a little more agile. And like I said, probably just a little bit of that uh, brute self-confidence that said, could we do it? Let's try it now or never. So we did. Eric, I'm curious about, as the current sitting president of the IIDA, of course, which is the International Interdesign Association, mm -hmm. which would be the equivalent of the AI for architects. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is, obviously, it is the organization for interdesign professionals. Right. And um, my perception as coming from the architecture industry myself is that these two fields can be bifurcated. It seems like there mm -hmm. is... Um, it just seems like you're an inter-designer, an inter-architect, or you're an architect, right? And it's like there's the separation. The IIDA is different than the AIA and stuff. I'm just curious about your perspective being the leader of an architectural practice that includes mm -hmm. inter-design services and interior architecture as well. What are the opportunities that you see for closer collaboration? But before you answer that, if you wouldn't mind, what are some of the problems that you see with the way that these two career paths are generated regarding what we all want to do, which is collaborate more? Mm -hmm. um, you're not wrong. There's definitely a bifurcation. Um, and so the problems with that, um, there's territorialism, there's uh, can and can't, there's hierarchy, there's what do you do? What do we do? What, what are they? What aren't they? Don't need, don't have on. There's all those kinds of things. And, um, it's all very negative and it's all very disruptive. Um, bifurcation is a great word because that's what it does. It sort of divides all of those tasks and those situations. If I'm the client, I'm not so sure I care about any of that. <laughs> so that's the problem. That's the big problem because they're not coming to you looking for, they want to know that you've got the credentials by all means. I'm not taking away from that. They want to know that they've hired a professional that has seen their degree and they're testing through to the highest. They want to make sure that that's accounted for, of course. But beyond that, it's so much about the ideas and the interaction and the trust that's built and those sorts of things. And I'm not entirely sure that we don't sometimes miss the opportunity in staking our claim or having our territories or having this divide line I'm also not entirely sure I have a great answer because for me, for whatever reason, I was put on a path that has never worked in a practice like that. I started after school. I came out of a program at K-State that's already got a little bit of a, of a misnomer. We have interior designers, we have interior architecture, we have architects, we have landscape. But under on one umbrella, you can get a degree in, in, in any, of the, any of those things. So there was already collaboration happening in my college level. And when I started working out of practice, I worked for a firm that very proudly considered themselves a big I, meaning interior designer, interior architecture, little a. So they did less architecture, more interior design, but they definitely had both on staff. In fact, all of our founders were licensed architects. And so I didn't ever see it happen differently. And so I was raised in a firm that was very collaborative and that was seeing it. So for me, a lot of times when I would hear colleagues talk about the challenges, or I would hear about interior designers that were maybe one in a practice of a much larger practice of architects and, and hearing some of the challenges that they had. Or when later I was in a, a leadership roundtable and I heard firm leaders talk about pay scales that were inequitable and that they would hire different designers and architects at different levels. Those things were also foreign to me uh, that, that they oftentimes did allow for great conversations to be had because I just had never seen it done. So I spoke from a place of this was positive and the benefits that we saw, and to your point about the opportunities, were to have different viewpoints, different voices, and certainly different people that had studied in a different way, bringing forth that information to a project team and blurring the lines between the inside and the out so often gave us an advantage to be able to talk about the programmatic or the people-centric part of design that we do from the very beginning, and then being able to have enough information about that program to wrap it and cite it and see the constraints that you might have on the exterior, but working those two things together hand in hand, as opposed to one being developed without the other and running into sort of those, those, those push points, if you will. So for me, I had always seen it 
as a positive, and I'd seen it as a respected situation coming into the role. I would also say we didn't and haven't and still don't at Helix get terribly hung up with architecture designer in the role you're placed on the project. So we also recognize, like for myself, interior architect degree always have been more driven on the management side and client management, business development, seeing those pieces and parts being really what I do well in the practice and can continue to do well. Having worked with incredible designers, again, architects, interior designers, interior architects, letting them take forward the design lead was so much more important for me to understand what my role was, less about my my discipline or my degree I'd studied in school, if that makes sense. Having gone from a large firm to then launching a startup firm and now a merger with what we typically call a mid-sized firm, what would you say would be the top three criteria of success? So the top three move, movers of success regarding the business of architecture. Mm-hmm. In each one? Well, just from, if you could summarize just three of them based upon your experience and all, if you had to sit down and say, you know what, here's here's what I would say would be the top movers of success in the business of architecture, one, two, and three. What would they be? Quality of projects and clients and alignment of values, first and foremost. Doesn't matter the size. You've got to work with people that believe in you and you believe in them. You've got to, you've got to like them. You've got to know that they represent what you want to represent in business and in design. And so that alignment of values really is, again, size somewhat, not less dependent. I haven't met an architecture owner that hasn't said their people are incredibly important to everything they do. They've got the best fill in the blank. So that taking care of those people, whatever that means, offering a great benefit salary, offering uh, leadership development, having a great culture, being able to have communication, transparency with leadership so that they know where they stand. That I think also is, you know, again, somewhat independent of size. I think you got to have fun. I think what we do is great. I think there are so many people that I've had clients tell me that their best week of their best hour of the week is when they get to come to the design presentation. We get to do that all day long. And yeah, what we do is hard and it is definitely wrought with sticky situations and tensions that we have to work through. But by and large, it's a really fun practice that we get to go through. And so I think that um, needs to be reminded that it's that is a joy and privilege that we get to do what we get to do. So I think that can also be celebrated um, at any at any level of size. What would you say would be the top three toxic management mistakes that you've seen? And we'll throw in toxic management and leadership. We'll just kind of merge those two. Kind of leadership is probably the better word. Um, lack of self-awareness. Tell me more. What do you mean? I've seen so many well-intentioned people take something too far because they know for themselves this is the way it needed to go or needed to be, and they're not seeing that that whatever they're saying or doing is not landing around them. So there's just not an awareness that it is missing the mark. And so they continue down that path, and it continues to just sort of erode whatever it is they're trying to do. And I do say well-intentioned because I'd like to pride myself on not having chosen bad partners or bad people to be in leadership situations, but everybody's got their strengths and you know weaknesses. And so you see that and you can almost see it and you want to say, gosh, I don't think that they quite realize that's not having the the effect or the, the, op- the change or the opportunity that they're desiring. And so they're getting dug in, heels dug in, and not maybe recognizing that if they would change a little bit about what they're saying or doing, how to approach it, that that might be a better result. So I call it self-awareness, but it's sort of that ability to be adaptable in that. I am not a fan of micromanagers in any way, shape, or form. I believe that if you have hired right and you have empowered with a vision for people to know what they are to do, you have got to trust the result and you've got to trust them to do their job. I just don't like that. So I have seen that failure and I think it doesn't grow people it doesn't promote a sense of uh, encouragement or any ownership, and it doesn't give people a chance to fail, which we know is the best way to learn. So there's there's instead this fear and this uh, 
trepidation and and maybe unwillingness to push something because they just they're not sure if it's if it's been allowed and i and i really don't think that that's a healthy way to keep people growing and and again we're in a practice and so they've got to practice it and you're going to fall down and you're going to fall and 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 we we in our job is to make sure nobody falls too far and and does something you know to risk or to damage a, a relationship but I think there's a lot of opportunity to give within that and to not be uh, be micromanaging in that way. And then I think the last one probably has all to do with ego. Because again, I think that in design, it can be so, uh, so precious. And the designers that I've worked with that have the ability to see beyond their one idea or their one answer to something to really embrace the notion of design can come from anywhere and that the client may throw you for a curveball and it's okay that we're going to pivot and change and in and in not being able to sort of pick up your toys and go away and not you know not be able to sort of voice that i do think that's a little bit of an ego and and maybe it's a little it's a little bit of that self-awareness like i said at the beginning as well but there is some of that that i that i see or have seen um folks stumble on Beautiful. Excellent. So we we went over kind of top three things for leadership success. We talked about three potential, well, toxic, toxic leadership <laughs> styles. Uh, you said no one, no one, not many people like micromanagement. I think that's uh <laughs> that's that's not uncommon. And I should give the caveat that there's a lot more toxic things than that, but those are what I consider from a relatively good leader, right? That these are just things that I think people stumble on. We know there's a lot of other things that people do and have done that are much more toxic. But when you use that word toxic, it makes it sound a bit more extreme. These are things I think you see just in the everyday general practice. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Eric, as we finish up here, I would love any insights um, as, as a woman in the profession of architecture and design. And the only reason I bring this up is just because in today's day and age, obviously it's still a male-dominated profession. And I know a lot of our listeners... Um, you know, identify with the female gender. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, you know, there's challenges that go along with that. And I'm always getting notes from people saying, hey, I would love if you asked these questions or how did they do it? Or how did they, you know, how did they succeed sure. in this profession? Sure. Success is certainly the out of the older. And I'm sure any day of the week, I could tell you I'm succeeding more. And, and then there's days of the week when you don't necessarily feel that. So uh, that's a little bit of a of the self, I guess, a self-fulfilling piece of you that you need to feel success or not. But as far as being a woman leader, um, I quite candidly have never thought of that as being a distinguisher. I know there are a lot of people that do. Um, I was raised by parents that never treated me any different than my sister or brother. I was uh, expected to do a lot of the same things. And I think coming out of school and being self-driven, there were just milestones I wanted to achieve. And I don't think I ever thought about it a whole lot. I have had partners pointed out to me. I have uh, been so bold to say that there's you know, that I was not discriminated against as being a woman leader. And one of my, you know, one of my partners uh, said respectfully, you, you, you aren't always there at the conversations. You haven't maybe been in uh, the golf game or the locker room after, or you haven't necessarily heard this. And so there are times when you might not, I take that and accept that. And I can understand that. I also think um, for those who haven't worked hand in hand with a strong leadership team or a duo, I find that there's a lot of benefit from the, 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 really the, the two sides or the two angles that men and women can offer any client, any conversation, any lead up to a project practice. I actually would tell you it's a little bit that, that, that a secret and a good weapon and weapons, the wrong word, but a little bit of that uh, benefit to two different voices. I recount early days where you might've been, I might've been the only woman in the room, but nobody ever forgot my name. Nobody ever didn't know who I was. It got me confused with someone else. Uh, I definitely hope in the future that does become a problem. I hope there are more women. If we get to a place we already are, and we are seeing that in a great way. But I have always seen it as a strength or seen it as two different viewpoints, two different vantage points. Um, I tend to use humor. I tend to use a more casual style. I don't know that that's dependent on the fact that I'm a woman. I think that may be more my leadership style. But I do think it brings people together in a closer way. I think there's a an ease to conversations that happen. So again, is that a different voice or is it just who I am? I don't know. But I have always seen it as, as a benefit in my career. And 
probably due to the fact that I really didn't think of it as that much of a difference or a differentiator when I started. It's been pointed out to me more often as I've gone along in my career, but it's not something I, I think about a whole lot. What advice would you give to the younger generation from a leadership perspective today for success in their careers? Oh, yeah. So they are redefining. The younger generations are absolutely redefining in a good way the amount of hours and time we spend um, on our practice, certainly coming straight out of school, and I think in, in all the best ways. But if you believe the 10,000 hours rule of something, it's going to take a little bit longer to maybe practice. So there's a part of me that would say, be patient and be willing to to still put in that time to your craft, that, to, to really spend the time learning and growing and and again, fully supportive of the balance that people are finding and in, in a great way that our profession especially was probably long overdue for. Um, I also like to encourage our folks at Helix to be involved in their community. I think those are transferable situations and skills and opportunities. You're growing your network and that's yours. That's yours to take wherever you go. I hope you have a long career at Helix, but for those that, that move on, that's that's theirs to take with them. And so I would Seek those, you know, seek those opportunities and and take those as advantages to being able to uh, to build to build your career. Um, I've always had strong mentors. I find them to be uh, that they've organically come to me. I, I'm not a big fan of, of subscribed or prescribed mentorship situations, but when you do have them, I'd hold on to them tight. I'd keep checking in with them when they give you your time. When they give up their time, come prepared with a question. Come prepared with something that's been on your mind that you've been thinking about so that you're spending that time and their time wisely because it's very precious that they're giving you that too. So I think between um, recognizing it's a long it's a long career and there's going to be time where you can give outside of the workday to things, there are going to be times when that's not what you want to do and it's okay. And so just recognizing where you are in your life, but then seeking out those opportunities to continue to build your resources, your network, grow, grow your uh grow your profession, grow as your, you know, grow as a professional yourself. Erica Moody is the president of Helix Architecture Design based out of Canvas City with office also in Denver, as well as the current International Interior Design Association president. Erica, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap. Hey, Enix Sears here. And I have a request since you are a listener here of the Business of Architecture podcast. Ryan and I, we love putting this podcast together. We love sharing information as much as we can glean from all the other industries that we're a part of to bring it back to empower you as an architect and a designer. And one thing that helps us in our mission is the growth of this podcast, simply because it helps other architects stand for more of their value, spreads the business information that we're sharing to empower architects together. So architects, designers, engineers can really step into their greatness, whatever that looks like for each individual. And so here, my, my simple ask is for you to join us and be part of our community by doing the following, heading over to iTunes and leaving a review of the podcast. And as an expression of our sincere thanks, we would like to give you a free CEU course that can get you one professional development unit, but more importantly, will give you a very solid and firm foundation on your journey to becoming a profitable and thriving architect. So here's the process for that. After you leave us a review, send an email to support at businessofarchitecture.com. Let us know the username that you use to leave the review, and we will send you that free training. On the training, you'll discover what 99% of architecture firm owners wished they would have known 20 years ago. And the other 1%, well, they just didn't even know that they didn't know. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review now. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way 
of doing exceptional architecture. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.